Morali, as neuroscientists, we learn a great deal about how the normal brain works by seeing, tragically, what happens when we have disease and trauma and see what's lost. You are an expert in Alzheimer's disease, and you've seen the tragic impact of it. What can we learn from the specifics of Alzheimer's in terms of how the brain works so that we can understand the normal brain? So Alzheimer's has given us, uh, Alzheimer's research has given us tremendous insight into how the brain ages in general and how the brain goes wrong uh, in the case of Alzheimer's. So originally we thought Alzheimer's was a disease just of old people. You know, we used to call it old timers disease, so you didn't have to worry about it till you were in your 70s or 80s. Now we know that the Alzheimer's pathology silently builds up in the brain perhaps 15, 20 years before someone gets memory loss. So the first lesson from that is if you're in your 40s or 50s, that's around the time when the pathology starts building up. So you really need lifelong brain maintenance program to make sure that at your 40s and 50s, this pathology doesn't start. The second interesting thing we've discovered is the plaques and tangles, which are the root sort of pathology that defines Alzheimer's disease. They seem to have a, a slightly different timeline. So uh, one theory that is currently uh, uh, very predominant is the plaques come before the tangles. So the plaques are uh, the accumulation of these abnormal twisted proteins between nerve cells that appear to sort of uh, damage uh, nerve cell communications. And the neurofibrillary tangles are microtubule proteins uh, that are abnormally folded inside the nerve cells that destroy the nerve cells from inside. So you have two attacks on nerve cells, one on the outside and one on the inside. Correct. And so if we really want to prevent Alzheimer's disease, much of our effort today is aimed at making sure that we can stop the initiation of the abnormal buildup of plaques and tangles. And we may have to start the process in the 40s or 50s. If we give, even if we had an effective vaccine and we gave it to someone who is 70 years old and their brain is already filled with plaques and tangles, it might be a little bit on the late side. So scientists think that's one reason why several trials that have been done for Alzheimer's that were given to people who already had early stage to late stage Alzheimer's didn't work was maybe because they were given at a relatively late stage. Yeah, now we know that there's a predisposition to Alzheimer's right. by genetic uh, right. um, uh, problems and, and uh, right. mutations. Uh, but even those people, there are things that can be done to prevent the onset. Well, we don't have a magic bullet yet to prevent the onset, uh, but there are several strategies uh, that uh, people can take to try to reduce their risk. So a typical uh, uh, person with a family history of Alzheimer's, if your dad or mom had it, uh, unless they got it in their 40s or 50s, which is a whole different entity mm-hmm. called early onset familial Alzheimer's, where the gene is very highly penetrant. If, you, if your dad or mom had late onset Alzheimer's, your risk goes up by about two or three fold. And we recently did a study where we looked at the spinal fluid of first degree relatives who were in their 50s. Even in their 50s, they were already starting to show what we call the Alzheimer's pathologic endophenotype in their spinal fluid. So mm-hmm. meaning, if we were to diagnose Alzheimer's solely using biochemical signatures, these people already had it. Even though they were asymptomatic. Even though they were completely asymptomatic, but they were on the road. So that means the process has already been triggered. And that is the group where we're really uh, very interested in intervening. So what can we do to keep our brains healthy? Well, there's several things. It's not 100% genetics. I think Alzheimer's may be 40, 50% genetic. Maybe there are other genes we haven't discovered, but there's another 40, 50% that seems to be environmental lifestyle uh, driven. So one of the biggest uh, risk factors that is a sort of, uh, maybe not a primary risk factor like the plaques and tangles, but somehow seems to be an additive risk factor is what we call a silent vascular disease. That is blockages in the blood vessels in the, in the, in the brain that lead to silent strokes. Mm-hmm. So anything you can do to lead a heart healthy lifestyle, watch your blood pressure, uh, watch your diabetes, your blood sugar, watch your weight, eat a sort of a heart healthy diet, you know, sort of a Mediterranean diet, lots of antioxidants, colored fruits, vegetables, get regular exercise, mm-hmm. including yoga meditation. Mm-hmm. Those I think uh, would be good strategies to try to reduce your that risk. That seems to be good strategies for just about everything. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, back to the mechanism of how it works. Uh, how do these plaques and tangles actually uh, impact the nerve cells and, and then and then how can you go from that to the specific uh, phenomenological or behavioral impact that they have? We're still trying to figure that out and that's one of the research questions and a great advance has occurred probably in the last uh, 10 years or so. Uh, before 
we had to rely on autopsy examination of brains to even look at plaques and tangles. So there was really no way to correlate how much plaques and tangles a person had with their clinical and behavioral phenotype. Mm -hmm. Now, um, there is a, a scan called an amyloid PET scan that has been wow. developed, where in a living person, you can actually image amyloid plaques. So we've published several studies and we showed that the presence of about 30% of normal people have silent plaque buildup. And the plaque buildup is much higher, as I mentioned, in people with a positive family history. The plaque buildup seems to be higher in people who eat a high fat diet. The plaque buildup seems to be higher in people who are less active. Uh, what we know that if you have a positive plaque, even though you don't have any memory problems today, you have a threefold higher risk for developing memory problems within the next three years. And in the brain, where do you see the plaque? You see it uh, ubiquitously across the whole brain, or is it So the plaques uh, start in certain specific regions of the brain. So they, for example, they start in a small part of the brain called the posterior cingulate cortex. Mm. And this also appears to be an area of the brain that is tightly linked to a new circuit, a relatively new circuit that's interesting in neuroscience called the default network. Mm. And from there, the plaques seem to spread. In fact, one of the very interesting theories people are talking about is, could this be a locally infectious process? Why is this plaque spreading throughout the brain? Could it be like a variant of mad cow disease, which mm. we know is caused by a particle called right. prions? They're right. not bacteria, they're not viruses. Right. You know, you're not going, it's not contagious. You're not going to get it by, you know, shaking hands with your, uh, with an infected patient. But could it be somehow locally infectious? Mm. Mm. Uh, what are the implications of that? Well, the implications are if the plaque is spreading and it's spreading sort of autonomously, then it's very critical. We have to be able to detect it when it's first a seed, mm -hmm. the smallest location. And if we can detect it then and stop it then, uh, that would probably be the most effective way of preventing Alzheimer's. And at some point, I'm not suggesting that we want to use these scans right now to screen patients. So it's not like a mammography or a colonoscopy. I'm not recommending anyone get screening amyloid PET scans. But there are some research studies that we are going to be conducting where we are going to be taking people who have the earliest signs of a positive scan to then try to see if we can somehow prevent its sort of progression either through a lifestyle intervention such as exercise or by giving them a plaque prevention vaccine. At the level of the neuron, how is it literally working when the plaque is building up or when the tangles are occurring inside? What, what's happening to the neuron? Is it getting less responsive? Is its action potential to electricity getting weaker? Uh, what is physically happening? I think there's a combination of factors. Um, the, uh, the buildup of these plaques probably sets up an inflammatory process. Yeah. And the inflammatory process sets off an immune response that's probably causing another type of cell in the brain called glial cells to somehow start attacking. So it's almost like an attack from within, friendly fire, if you will. Autoimmune. Autoimmune friendly fire. So that's one theory. The other theory is that the amyloid plaques somehow are building up inside blood vessels and they are blocking or reducing the blood supply to the brain. Right. So secondary effects. Secondary effect. The third is that there is a very important memory chemical that the brain cells uh -huh. use for forming and transmitting memories. It's called acetylcholine. That's the, that's the transmitter between that's neurons. That's the transmitter between neurons. And acetylcholine is manufactured in a factory in the brain called the nucleus basalis of Maynard. Mm -hmm. There's a specific group of cells in a mm -hmm. cell body. And so the, the third theory is that there is a damage to that factory causing a reduction in the amount of available acetylcholine. So as a result, the brain is not able to sort of uh, form memories effectively. Right, or call back its memories that, back. That, that, it, right. that it has. So isn't this, um, shall we say, proof positive that um, memory is physically located in the neurons? Yes and no. So uh, uh, we still, so, so, so memory, you know, we used to think of memories as sort of like uh, the brain and memory as sort of like a library. It's not like the National Library of Medicine where you have a bunch of filing cabinets and, you know, different memories of different experiences are stored in different files and all you have to do is go to the right folder, pick yeah. it up. No, it's not like we used to think that, but I don't think it's uh, the case. Uh, we now think that memories are stored in a distributed manner. So every time we have an experience, the brain breaks it down into multiple components, maybe thousands or tens of thousands of components. And each of these components is then interlinked to thousands of other components in the brain. So it's an interactive archiving system. And every time we try to recall something, we reconstruct the entire memory. Mm. That's why our memories are almost never identical to what we originally experienced them. 
That's why people have false memories. Yeah. That's why by changing the emotion of a person, yeah. you can actually change their actual recall of yeah. a memory because yeah. their brain is drawing on a different set of file folders to pull the information. <laughs> So what is the, your overall feeling in terms of the importance of understanding Alzheimer's? To me, we're going to be living longer as we get better at preventing heart disease, as perhaps as we develop new cancer therapies. You know, who wants to live to be 90 or 100 if you can't remember who you are or where you parked your car or, you know, uh, how much money you have in your bank balance or even more important, how to love your wife or your grandchildren or whatever. So ultimately, I think if we want to enhance brain longevity, uh, you know, into our 90s, into our 100s, uh, you know, I, I think we're going to have to learn from Alzheimer's. If we can cure and prevent Alzheimer's, we'll find a way to extend brain longevity at 10 or 15 years.